believe this was such a great, great way to end this conference. I always try to do something really interesting and vibrant. And I've known these two men a very short while, but they've written this book, Athena Rising, How and Why Men Should men Mentor Women. I think it's so current, and when we're talking about, you know, uh, moving forward with women, peace, and security, this is one of the main areas of importance. They do a fantastic job. Their bios are in the in the bio book, and I just want to turn it over to you because they're good. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy this one. <laughs> All right, well, well, thank you, Mary. Thanks for, uh, for having us here today. And uh, congrats to all of you. We were, Brett and I were just talking about, wow, it's pretty impressive at uh, 2.15 on a Friday afternoon that we've still got this many people in the room. So uh, I'm not sure if that's us or just the, the whole conference, but uh, thanks for being here. So we are, we're really delighted to be here today um, with all of you, all the rising Athenas in the room and, and uh, sprinkling of male allies out there too. It's great to, great to see you here today to focus on, for just a little while today uh, during our time, to focus on how to be more deliberate and strategic in forming mentorships with men at work. Um, as a sociologist, I'm Dave Smith. Um, all my research is in gender work and family. And so this is how I came upon this topic. And my colleague, uh, Brad Johnson, when we worked together at the Naval Academy, Brad's a clinical psychologist who focuses on mentoring and mentoring relationships. And it was clear to us as prior Naval officers that not just within the military, but society broadly today, we're seeing this in the civilian industry, um, just about every business out there today, that we have, especially in the more traditionally male professions, that we're having challenges, right, with uh, with not just recruiting, because we are doing better recruiting today, but re really retaining and promoting women up into the upper echelon of our organizations and leadership. And it was clear to us that having watched some of that go on in the military, we give a lot of great instruction and process on how to do gender integration, for example. And, and you know, my experiences of Having watched gender integration happen at the, at the Naval Academy as a student back in the early 80s, um, and watching that happen into the combat exclusion law change in the early 90s, and watching us integrate, in particular for me, into naval aviation, and being a part of that, uh, seeing it on the carrier and the squadrons, and then just recently, right, opening up all of our occupational specialties to women today, and some of the challenges we're seeing, uh, most notably the Marine Corps, uh, making the news more often lately. And, and so seeing all these things, you know, one of the things that was clear to us that became kind of, kind of obvious was that, you know, we're changing the, the dynamics and the relationship of the culture in the workplace. But we're really not, we've never really given any thought to how do we do that, what are the effects upon the people that are already there, how does it change that, and most importantly, um, if we're going to do this right, we need to start engaging men in this conversation. And so that's where Brad and I came along with this. And, and the evidence as we go through this, we'll talk a little bit about the research that we did and what we're bringing together here. Uh, but really the research is very clear that when women are mentored by men, they have more promotions, they have higher salaries, more professional skill development, better confidence, identity development, higher satisfaction in their jobs, and more commitment to the organization, which again all leads to retention right, into advancement and career eminence out there. Right. And much of that has to do with the fact that there are just not enough women in, in, in the echelons that can serve as mentors uh, for junior folks. Let us go ahead and start. I'm Brad Johnson. Let's go ahead and start with a definition, because we, we talk about mentoring occasionally. People have different thoughts about what that is. You know, there's, there's coaching where I maybe focus on just one skill deficit and, and try and develop that. There's sponsorship where I, you know, maybe give you a, a, a window into some opportunity. All of that's important. Mentoring is really a broader idea. It's sort of a, a relationship. And it really is, over time, a relationship that focuses on both career development and personal development, hopefully in kind of an integrated way. But if I'm your mentor, I'm really committed to your broad growth and development. And I'm usually with you kind of walking alongside for a longer period of time. So this is a relationship. The very best mentorships are reciprocal, mutual, kind of collegial relationships. And ironically, I don't know if this shocks you or not, but women seem to get that more uh, than men who sometimes struggle with the hierarchy 
uh, in mentorship and have a little more difficulty letting that go and allowing more collegiality to develop in the relationship. So that's something we need to work on. Now, next slide, you may sort of ask yourself if you're uh, like a lot of folks, why can't women just mentor other women? It's something that comes up a lot when Dave and I talk to men. Why can't women just do this, mentor other women? Well, there are a number of reasons. I, I think one thing's very clear. Women are not generally reluctant or unwilling to mentor junior women because many of you have internalized the warning from Madeleine Albright uh, years ago. You remember this stern warning. A uh, special place in hell for you if you uh, ignore junior women. Um, really, that's not it. There, there, really, there are a number of other factors. Number one, that the math doesn't work. There just are not, in the military, great example, there's just are not enough senior women to mentor junior folks. If guys don't step up, it's just not going to happen. A lot of junior folks are going to go unmentored. Um, often, there, there can be other dynamics in the workplace. So if there are very few positions open for women, it breeds competitiveness. You know, if I know only a few of us are going to make it up the chain, uh, it, it can be tougher for women to do that. Women are also under the microscope. There's some brand new research Dave and I have just come across. Um, if you're a woman and you champion a junior woman in your organization, what do you think happens to your evaluations at the end of the year? Uh, they actually go down just a little bit on, on whole. Uh, because, you know, you're biased, you're, you're showing favoritism toward a junior woman. Now, what happens if a male mentors a junior woman in terms of his evaluations? He actually gets a little bump because he's an advocate, he's a gender advocate. So there's even disparity about who mentors, you know, and what the effect uh, might be on, on their overall assessment of the end. I don't know if you could read that, but it says, I think I'm supposed to have a mentor, but I don't know why. So one of the things that we find is that you know, with women, it, it, sometimes it's hard to find that male mentor out there. And, and even if you do, um, what is it that I, what should I expect out of a, out of a good cross-gender relationship like that, a mentoring relationship? And, and so I think it's helpful to kind of understand why it could be a little bit challenging for the, for the guy side of this. And so one of the things we found in all the interviews we did with men and male mentors was we, we keep a lot of the reasons why guys are in some cases maybe more hesitant to sit to engage in this cross-gender relationship and may be on the sidelines a little bit so I'll just kind of run through these real quick quickly with you together we call these the reluctant male syndrome RMS gotta have a good acronym right and so why men are reluctant well you've heard a lot about this lately and, and certainly private industry is doing the same thing we see a lot of unconscious bias training. And unconscious bias and stereotypes are certainly out there, and they are certainly a part of it, right? So if I hold the stereotype as a man that a woman can't be a leader, she doesn't have that leader potential, she doesn't have what it takes, why would I invest my time in mentoring her? Because it takes a lot of time and effort and energy to do that. So we can see where if guys are looking at women that way with that particular bias or that stereotype, they might be hesitant to engage, right? So unconscious bias and stereotypes are certainly out there, and they're, they are a part of the equation, but they're not the only reason. So other reasons are might have to do with the relationship itself. So as men, um, most of us are pretty comfortable. I'll give myself as an example. You know, I have a mother. Uh, I know what that relationship looks like. Very comfortable with that. I have a wife. Um, very comfortable with that relationship. I even have a daughter, and I have that. I understand that. I know what that looks like. But sometimes, some men, when it comes to work, um, having a professional relationship with a woman at work, this, again, intimate, non-sexual relationship with a woman, is kind of like, ah, ugh, what is that? And, and guys can have a little anxiety about that, right? And we'll talk some more about that as we go through this. So that could be one of the reasons, too. Um, some other aspects. What happens uh, with perceptions? So we all know people talk, right? So guys are worried about, hey, what are my colleagues, my peers, my coworkers, my bosses? What are they going to think if I suddenly start spending a lot of time with this junior woman? And some of them, depending on their relationship at home with their significant other, um, they may be concerned about what their partner thinks about that relationship as well. So those perceptions are out there. And then finally, um, some guys, you know, want to help and want to be a part of the solution, but they're just afraid that, gosh, if I, if I say the wrong thing, if I do the wrong thing, 
I just put my foot in my mouth, and next thing you know, I've got some sort of an EO complaint, sexual harassment complaint against me. Ugh, just can't afford to do that. So there's a host of these reasons why guys can, um, could be on the sideline. So if you think, uh, we had a great presentation, by the way, on one of the panels that yesterday on, on uh, unconscious bias. Is that person still here? It was, uh, it was really a good uh, presentation. It was well done. Um, but, you know, lest you think these things are kind of going by the wayside and they're, they're no longer particularly prevalent, um, but let's just share with you something that we use with men when we're talking about bias uh, related to gender. Uh, and I'm a psychologist, so I love tests, so I'm going to just give you a quick sentence completion test. And what I'd like you to do is just answer, fill in the blank, and, and don't micromanage your response. Just first thing that comes to mind, what, what, how would you finish that sentence? Uh, and then, as soon as you do that, and I'll give you maybe uh, 10 seconds to do it yourself, no, two seconds to do it yourself, um, then I'm going to ask Dave to just be a, a typical dude in national security, and I'm, I'm going to ask <laughs> for his response as typical dude. And what I, I, I want to just draw your attention to is that women, uh, believe it or not, can internalize many of the same biases that, that men have got. And so listen to yourself you know, when you give your response, and, and uh, then we'll, we'll talk about them. But let's go ahead and do the first one here. So uh, I'll just read the sentence. Most women are? Quick response? Smart. 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 Wow. Okay. I wasn't even going to ask you to say it out loud, but this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go to the next one, then I'll give yours. You can make me look bad at the end. Yes. <laughs> women usually need? Relationship. A lot of, see, a lot of self management. Compared to boys, girls? What's that? Which rule? Intelligence. Um, next one. At work, women. Succeed. What was that? Okay. All right, and last one, female bosses. Our very are the best. <laughs> All right, so yeah, just, I was I'm going to ask Dave to kind of give you a sample of what we usually hear with men when we put them on the spot. So, Dave, most women are? So, the most women are, we get a lot of responses around nice. Uh, one, and this is the, this, they're nice, they're, it's great to have them there, they're pleasant. <laughs> Right, and, and this and this centers around what we we've, we've talked about for a long time in social psych is the, the women are wonderful effect, and you've probably heard this in different ways, and that it's the positive aspect of different kinds of sexism, right? and is this women are wonderful effect, and you will hear this come up often. Oh, sorry, I'll go back. Uh, so the women usually need. What do you think? What do you think the stereotype the bias is there? Help, 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 help right? Help, help and support, please. right? Yeah. Can't cannot do it on their self. And then the and then one step further down the path for some people is it might even be protection, depending on. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, right? Compared to boys, girls, girls are fragile and delicate. Okay, and and I've actually heard I mean I've heard this. Um, not in a test like this, you know. I've heard this conversation going on in the, around, certainly around military officers and, and, and training sessions and things like GMT. You hear this about how women are to be handled or treated differently. And it's like, oh, okay. But um, at work, women don't speak up. Cry is one. Don't speak up. Gossip. Right? These are, again, stereotypes, right, that and biases that, that boys have been socialized in many cases and learning and held on to as men in some cases. They may not necessarily ascribe to them, but they, but they do know them in many cases. And then certainly, we get into the double bind, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, with female bosses. Yeah, pick your favorite B, B word, right? <laughs> and uh, bitch your boss. So the, the problem with these, of course, it, you know, they're, they're all stereotypes, they're all lurking. Um, if you've read Malcolm Gladwell's book of Blink, you know, this is implicit knowing, it's unconscious bias. The beauty of a, a stereotype is it's a shortcut, let's just make really quick assessments of somebody else. The, the downsides are often wrong, they're often incorrect, and they're incomplete, uh, and they disable, uh, disenfranchise, in this case, an entire 
half of the population. So remember, this is lurking with men. Sometimes with mentoring, they've got to be more aware of this. But women can internalize this, and we'll come back to this uh, a little bit later. So I'll talk a little bit more about the, the perception piece of this. And uh, the, the woman you see here, this is uh, one of our prior students uh, at the Naval Academy. This is uh, Lieutenant Virginia Brody. She's on my team. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can correct me here if I need to, if you need to right? So you, she was a row, you were a She was a, she was a coxswain with yeah. me on the crew team okay. for four years. She's like one of my best friends. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. See, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you tell her, tell her story, but I'll tell you from our perspective you can add. But so Brad and I both, both had her as students in our classes and, uh, you know, Virginia, uh, when you first see her, she, the first thing that may, may come to your mind may not be the, this warrior. Person, right, and because Virginia stands maybe about five two, maybe on her tippy toes on yeah. five two, um, and you know she's just not this huge presence. And when you see her in you know in uniform, that may not be the first thing that comes to mind. And but just an incredibly gifted student and leader and perceptive person uh, that you know we just really enjoy working with Virginia, and I still you know to this day keep in touch with. Um, but you know, one of the things is we came up with the term Athena and for the title of the book. One of the things that we found at the Naval Academy was very helpful was to, to think about our the female students there uh, as as these Athenas, right? These rising Athenas. These, you know, if you think about the goddess Athena, so both uh, in terms of, of the goddess of war, right, and this warrior, but also as a diplomat, right, and reason and the arts, and so this blend of both. And we felt that you know that was a, a great way to think about how do we perceive um, the women we work with. You know, they can if we think about them as Athenas out there, that they do have that potential to be all those things, to be the leaders, to be the warriors. At the same time, they can embody all those things about being the diplomat. All right. So we, we have to address this issue right off the bat. It's one of the, it's one of the things we have to always deal with. Uh, and it is the whole issue of attraction. Whenever you start talking about cross-gender mentoring, this often comes up. It comes up with groups of men that we talk uh, with in particular. And, you know, there's almost this phobia. You know, what if I'm attracted to her? And, and you can just sense the anxiety. Uh, maybe they've had that experience before. And so, you know, we talk about the fact that, yeah, let's just put it right on the table. There is all this evidence on evolutionary biology and psychology, and if you happen to be a heterosexual and you're in a cross-gender mentorship, chances are pretty good at some time, if you mentor quite a bit, that you'll feel attraction for somebody. There are many things about uh, mentorships that I think develop some attraction occasionally. You spend a lot of time together. Uh, you, you, you rely on one another, you do a lot of talking and disclosure. As the relationship goes on, you meet more. There's some intimacy in the relationship. You share interests and values often, and so we shouldn't be shocked uh, occasionally when we notice, well, I'm a little attracted to that person, or I find that person attractive. Um, there's also all the architecture we have from our evolutionary forebears, and uh, you know, if you look at the evidence, it's pretty clear men still unconsciously are looking for fertility markers in, in uh, the other gender, especially if they're heterosexual. So we're looking for, uh, apparently we're looking for full lips and facial symmetry and a certain hip to waist ratio. And all of that's kind of going on, you know, unconsciously, not particularly aware of it. Um, so we want to acknowledge that. Attraction happens. And I, I just have to say, when we're talking with men, I, I'll often say, wouldn't life be a lot more dull if you didn't ever find anyone attractive? Uh, so I think we need to get over that. So to put men at ease, we do have a huge new neurologic breakthrough that we do like to share with them. And I didn't get clearance because this might be uh, a secret, Mary. Uh, but we're just going to go ahead and share it. We have a brand new fMRI. Uh, of the male brain that we hope puts men at ease. So let's go ahead and share. So it turns out men have a frontal lobe. Um, yeah. and, uh, that, of course, allows judgment, decision making, you know, reasoned. Uh, I can reason my way through life and not be impulsive. Um, so 
that would suggest that we're capable of recognizing attraction, taking appropriate steps to not allow that to intrude on a relationship, be thoughtful about it, maybe seek consultation if I really need to do that. But experiencing attraction need not lead to you know, inappropriate behavior. And so if we can just deal with the attraction thing right off, we find that very helpful. One last thing we'll share with men, there's a whole other stream of social psych research on perceived mutual attraction. Essentially, if I feel attraction to somebody, to what extent do I believe that a person is also attracted to me? Well, when you look at all the studies, it turns out there's a remarkable gender effect. Any idea which sex tends to overestimate <laughs> guys? So, so we tell guys, look, don't embarrass yourself. She's just not that into you. <laughs> take it, you know. Take the research, uh, because so don't let that ruin or intrude on a good mentoring relationship. So certainly, as we come into a, any sort of a mentoring relationship, we bring our own baggage, right? Our own experiences in life. Now, but one of the things we found uh, throughout is how men are socialized today in our society, specifically. Um, there are some common themes there that can play out in mentoring relationships. Some of them are, are not necessarily completely helpful, although they sound very positive and helpful in lots of ways. So I'll we'll talk to you a little bit about these. Uh, for the guys, they, they tend to follow these scripts. It's a script, a social script that they follow. We call these the man scripts uh, because these are ones that we find guys fall back on. Why do they fall back on these scripts? Because sometimes when we get a little anxious, we have a little anxiety about how the, an interaction, we fall back on what we're comfortable with. It's the same way stereotypes work. You, fall, you fill in the missing information of what you, what you know and you're comfortable with. So let me tell you about a couple of these that we talk to men about. Hey, be careful with these and, and just try to be self-aware. And, and certainly, uh, hopefully, women right in the relationship, you can at some point be comfortable enough to talk to your mentor about this if you, you see these things happening. So I mentioned uh, I have a daughter, right? And so I have a relationship with my daughter. I think it's a very, it's a good relationship. It might be unique to, to us, but uh, that father-daughter relationship in particular um, can translate into the workplace. Where again, if you have an older, an older man um, who is the male mentor, a younger woman, it can look kind of, you know, maybe the age difference there could be close to a father-daughter type age difference. And sometimes men will fall back on that. But again, to, to relieve that anxiety that they're feeling about this relationship that they're having. And again, I think that's a positive thing for, for me with my daughter, but it may not be a positive thing for my female mentee. Why? Because there are times when I, as a father, I'm going to step forward and I'm going to become the protector and I'm going to do things for her that, again, as a, as a dad and as a father, I think it might be appropriate. Um, you're, we tell the guys, you know, your female mentee does not need protecting. She does not need you to take one for her. She does not need you to hold back, hold her back, uh, because you are not empowering her. Right? We are holding, we're overprotecting, and we're keeping her from the opportunities and the same challenges that the men are getting. Right? So if I if, if I do this with my if I did it with my male mentees and I did it for my female mentees at the same time, that might be one thing. But generally, that doesn't happen. Right? I'm not going to in, invoke the father daughter relationship with a male mentee. Another one that you'll, you'll often see um, is kind of the, and this comes from different places in our country where we see uh, chivalry, uh, certainly in the South, uh, certainly in the military we see a lot of this, where the, the man, the, the male mentor might become a little bit of the knight you know, in shining armor, and the woman is the, the damsel in distress, right? That's the, the man script there. And again, um, it seems like a positive one, and it is generally, right? And most people are comfortable with it, right up to the point, again, where you are holding her back from experiencing something that she needs to experience, from a challenge, from going through something developmentally that it might be kind of hard to watch her grow and, and maybe fail a little bit, or stumble along the way. But that's how we grow. That's how we learn. That's how we get to the next step. That's how we advance in life. Um, we all didn't get here today because, you know, our, somebody was holding us back the whole way, right, and protecting us. So we, we encourage guys to, to kind of become more self-aware and understanding about these manuscripts so that if you see them, you know, you can kind of pull them in, right, them in a little bit. So we've been kind of giving you some background intel just about gender and cross-gender dynamics. <laughs> 
we just want to kind of give you a background about this project and the research that we did. And then we'll get into the toolbox. That's kind of the second part. These are the things we try and tell men about what you want to do if you want to be an effective mentor for women. So these are the behaviors you want to try and enact. And we'll share a few of those with you. Um, when Dave and I were putting our heads together and thinking about cross-gender mentoring, a few things were going on. I don't know if you remember some of these events. Uh, Tim Hunt, Nobel Prize winning scientist in Britain, had just come out in the media in an interview when asked, well, do you work with women in your research? And he said, oh, oh no, I never would do that. Three things happen. They fall in love with you, you fall in love with them, or they cry if you try and give them you know, any kind of criticism, so I would never do that. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, I think a story leaked in the Washington Post about congressional staffers. So women congressional staffers were implicitly informal policy, but a powerful policy, not allowed to ever meet with their male congressmen after hours. So after 5 o'clock, no, uh, male staffers could do that, but not females. Why? Was it, was it for their best interests? Uh, really to protect the reputation of, of the male congressman because we don't want him to be seen with a woman after hours. It could stir some gossip and that might affect his re-election. Then when they followed up and looked at salaries, you know, no surprise, uh, women staffers made far less than their male counterparts. Those male staffers were getting all the evening events, all the networking, all the connection that happens in those important uh, sort of networking moments. No one was talking about the effect on women who were not at those uh, events. And then the coup de grace for Dave and I, working with Marines and sailors, uh, was right about the time that we were just starting to write the book that one of the very first women to be the CEO of a Marine Corps boot camp was fired. Um, this is somebody that we know. And the reason that was given for her firing was she was too aggressive. And, you know, Dave and I just looked at each other and said, really, a Marine, too aggressive. <laughs> and we worked with these guys all day, you know, it just, the absurdity of it you know, I was not lost on us. Um, but just so many of these gender moments uh, in the media were happening right at the time we were sitting down to, to work on this. Now, as we started to share with people that we want to write about how men can mentor women, a book on mentoring women, one of the first things people would say to us, and we understand it now, was, really, you guys realize you're dudes? Really? Are, you, are you aware of that? Uh, and we are, we're aware we're men. Uh, and so they were pointing out that maybe you want to get some consultation. And so all our research for this book involved going to interview uh, women. And we interviewed women that had kind of made it to the top of their profession leading off with Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook, and we had a four-star admiral, four-star general, I think both Marines and the Army. Um, we had women who were CEOs and vice presidents, and they kindly gave their time for an interview, and we asked them, did you have male mentorship? And almost all of them did. And then we asked, well, what went well? What was a, a great example of, of what was very effective and what didn't go well? And then we put together this toolbox, combining that with the literature on, on cross-gender mentoring. So that's what we've got. We want to just kind of share with you some of our favorites, the, the things that women told us. If, if guys could just get this, uh, it would be so much more helpful uh, in mentoring relationships. So we'll share sort of the top elements. So number one on the list was listen. <laughs> Unequivocally, every single woman we, we interviewed said that their male mentors, the thing that they did best was they actually listened to them. And they listened to what they were saying, and they weren't just making assumptions or going off of stereotypes and bias out there. Uh, some of that was a learning process along the way, but uh, one of the things we find with guys, and, and I know that you know I can relate to this, and I know Brett probably does too, that you know, we have this, the other thing you didn't see in that brain scan up there was we have this extremely large fix-it gene sometimes about problem solving. And I think sometimes my military upbringing even made it worse um, that, you know, I'm always looking to solve problems. It's always about problem solving. So when somebody comes to me, especially in a mentoring relationship, it would be really easy to sit there and listen. I'm listening to Mary, and she's going she's gonna to tell me what the problem is, and then I'm going to fix it for her, right? And it's going to be great. And 
That's not what mentoring is all about. There, yes, there might be some of those out there that we do need to pay attention to, but often, uh, sometimes we just need to listen to a firm that, that maybe you just want to affirm that you belong in the organization, that you can compete, that you got here on your own merits, that you can rise to the highest levels, and we can just we can affirm that as mentors out there. So it's not always about us looking and listening for a problem and solving it, but just actually listening, not assuming what she needs, what she wants, right? But what she's really telling us, listening to what her dreams and her aspirations are, and then helping her to achieve those along the way. So following on, uh, maybe the second most frequent thing we heard was, please don't make assumptions about me because I'm a woman. Don't, don't assume what I want to do, what I'll not want to do, my career trajectory, don't make those quick assumptions about me based on one factor, my gender. Uh, this is Robert Lightfoot. He's the current director of NASA. Uh, we got to Robert because we interviewed Janet Petro, who directs the Kennedy Space Center, and she said Robert Lightfoot was such a terrific mentor. We, we then tracked him down and got an interview with him. And he said, you know, honestly, guys, I really got this wrong often early in my career. I, I had multiple issues with making assumptions. I thought I was being very benign and gender aware, and then it turned out I snuck an assumption in there, and it led to a bad outcome. He said, here's a great example. I was on an executive selection committee years ago at NASA. Far and away, the best candidate was a woman. And as the selection committee was sitting around the table on the last meeting, giving our last two cents about who to offer the job to, I tried to show how gender aware I was, and I said, well, you know, this job does involve a lot of travel. And she did just have a baby. And he said, luckily, a woman was sitting right across from him uh, at the selection meeting with, with flames coming out of her eyes. <laughs> and she said, Robert, I, I'm really pretty sure she knows that uh, it involves travel, and I'm really sure she knows she had a baby. So I hope that if we don't make that decision for her, we let her decide. If she's the, the candidate, we'll offer her the job and let her decide. He said, it was such an epiphany. Now, in retrospect, it seems so silly of me, but I, you know, I, I didn't get it uh, initially. He said, I still struggle with this. I've got a male and female, happen to be a husband and wife, on my senior executive team at NASA. I know they have high school kids. I know there are events uh, at school. And I find myself saying to her, hey, you don't need to be at this meeting this afternoon. I, I know you have that event. And then the light bulb goes on, and I realize I never say that to him. Uh, I never say the same thing to him. So kind of a very gendered assumption about who should be home, who should be at the events. And he said, I've had to learn, sometimes painfully, to, to just talk about the pros and cons, let her decide, but I, I'm not gonna make a decision. Paradoxically, her not being at that meeting may undermine her success uh, in the organization. He said, one other area where I really think I, I've learned to be a better mentor for women uh, is in the whole area of not taking for granted immediate reluctance to be put forward for promotion. He said, I've got you know, a job open at NASA, there are eight criteria, I advertise it, and I get all these guys throwing their hat in the ring, and they only meet three criteria. And they're like, yeah, male bravado, yeah, I can do it. Uh, and then I've got all these talented women that meet seven and three quarters, and, and they don't apply for the job. And I, I will go to them and say, why are you putting your, your name in for this? And they're often very reluctant, careful, I'm not sure, you know, I'm ready. Uh, they've got maybe messages about being an imposter or not, not being prepared, I'm trying to be very careful with the criteria. And he said, I've, I've got to encourage them and, and let them know what other folks in the organization are doing. Uh, go ahead and put your name in the, in the hat, because I really think you're the one for this job. He said, I've really got to work at that a little bit more. So one of the things we talked about with uh, the Nobel scientist Tim Hunt, he said that one of the three things that happens if you work with women is that if you give them critical feedback, they will cry. And lots of men become very uncomfortable when it comes to the expression of these kinds of emotions at work or anywhere, and certainly they're worried about giving, you know, saying something that's going to make her emotional or cry. And, and so I think it's, it's appropriate, we talk to the guys about this all the time, that it's important to understand one, one uh, what, the, what, what is the biology and where, where is the cultural and social aspects of, of crying come from? 
And so um, if you look at in the biology of it, women produce uh, more prolactin, right? Which is also one of the things that produces tears, right? So do women produce more tears than men? Yes. Are they expressed in the same way? No, right? It's different. That's a social construct um, about how tears are expressed. We, there's even research out there, again, using um, real functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, where we take men and women, we, we show them pictures, right? show them photographs of things that should evoke a reaction, some sort of an emotional reaction, in this case, uh, things that are kind of sad or negative. And you know what? We find in the fMRIs, they, the brains light up just about this, exactly the same, right? So we're seeing it occur in the brain the same, they're reacting, but the emotional, the, the expressive aspect of it is very different. And again, and if you look at Western society in particular, and, and it varies by, by cultural uh, aspects and societies out there, but in our Western society, the, how are boys and girls raised? Right? So as a little boy, if you start to cry, very quickly we learn that, hey, that's not okay, and we're told, don't cry, don't be a little girl, right? And the same thing, you know, for girls, it's, it's the opposite, right? They, not so much, right? It's okay. It, it's, it's socially acceptable. Boys are shamed when they cry. So we find that, again, they're, they're not comfortable with doing that. And then they grow up that way when they're working with other little boys along the way, playing sports, doing whatever it is they do, that, uh, that it's not okay to show emotions like that. And then that goes on into their adult life. And that's why men become a little more uncomfortable sometimes with the expression of emotion and tears. Um, the other aspect is tears can mean different things. So let me give you a couple a story about this. So we had the, the, the privilege of uh, interviewing uh, General Dana Moore from the Air Force. And many of you might know Dana. She's up at uh, Harvard now. Um, but one of the stories that she told us that uh, we like to tell about in this section is um, you know, when she was coming up through the ranks, uh, she had a boss, and it was also a mentor. And you know, when they worked together on a project, um, when she got really excited about it, very passionate about a topic, she would kind of tear up. And, and I think a lot of us probably have, have felt that at times. When we get really excited about it, passionate about something, you, you, not crying, but you, you can see the emotion, you can see the tears a little bit. Um, it made her boss, her male boss, really uncomfortable. To the point that at one, eventually, came in one day and said, Dana, work on this project here. I want to know what you think about this unemotionally. And it was just like this, oh, you know, really, is that is that what this is, this relationship is going to be all about? And it, it was really hard to work with him at that point. And you really kind of feel like you're, you're giving to the team. We have to tell you about it unemotionally. Um, in different um, areas, we also find that we work with special operations folks, uh, and the women in particular in special operations today, um, they don't like us to even talk about this topic about because tears are not okay. And, and they specifically asked us not to, not to say that, that it's okay, you know, tears are okay, it's okay to cry, don't, don't, go, down, don't go down that road because they just get the women, right, are, are almost harder on themselves than the men are about this because it's just, again, part of their culture in special operations. Um, another reason why, you know, why is this a problem with men in particular is that we learn that, you know, we get uneasy about the tears and the emotional aspect of it, um, and then so we tend to then to kind of overprotect or or even not even um, challenge women in the same way or provide the right kind of critical feedback that you need to develop and to grow into what it is you need to do. So kind of the pull, you're pulling punches, right, when you need to be giving them everything. So one of the examples we have here uh, in working with uh, our SEER school in the military, the Survival, Evasion, Resistance, Escape School, right? When women were first integrated into that, I will find you probably remember some of this, <laughs> um, that, you know, when women went through the program, there's a part there at the very end, when the 24 hours in the prisoner of war camp, where you get the whole experience, and part of that is to, to have really take people to that emotional brink of breaking down and to see how they're going to react to that, how they're going to handle themselves and learn from it. To become stronger so that, God forbid, if and when it ever happened to you, right, you could handle it in a, in a better way and come back and return with honor. Well, the first time women were going through this program, we found that the male instructors, the minute they got emotional, the women got emotional, they just back off. Right, and it's like, whoa, time out. We got to pull everybody, pull everybody in. Let's talk about this and, and kind of refocus the, the instruct the male instructors. Like, no, you cannot do that. 
right? You are denying them the same opportunity, the same challenges to grow and to develop. You're hurting them, you're hurting their people, and you're hurting our country by doing this. And so this is one of these ones where we have to think about as guys, why, why might we pull punches? Why might we not give critical feedback? Um, we talked uh, with um, was the senior vice president at, at Walmart, Susan Chambers, and you know, Susan said that she would not have been where she was running their whole global people division, HR. Uh, she would not have been where she was, but hadn't been for a couple of really important male mentors that she had that provided this really great heart, she called it just kind of brutal, harsh truth, right? This critical feedback that helped her to see who she was and what she could become. And they set these almost, she felt like they were almost impossible standards, but they just saw in her the ability to grow and to develop and climb to reach that. And that really helped her get there. And we had another senior vice president uh, at Sodexo, Rohini Anand. Rohini was telling us, you know, that was one of her complaints about her male mentors was that she felt like she just didn't get challenged enough by them, that they didn't provide uh, that same type of critical feedback that she needed to grow. She had to go elsewhere for that. So this is a, I think it's a great conversation to have about, you know, this balance between protection and empowerment as we go through this. So to, to change it up a little bit, um, someone just here, Several of you, just tell me what's going on. This is an after work picture at a bar. So just tell me what's happening here. Mentoring. What's going on? It's mentoring. Yeah, of course. What else would it be? Now let's look at the next picture. Uh, what's going on here? Mentoring. <laughs> a few of you were a little slower on that one, though. Huh? So the, so the whole perception issue has got to be addressed. We talk about attraction a bit, but you also, if you're in a cross-gender mentorship, you've got to be honest about perceptions. People talk. They're going to continue to talk. You have to be thoughtful about that. Um, men, I think, sometimes get themselves into trouble here with perceptions. Either they're phobic about perceptions and run the other way when it comes to maybe mentoring a woman, or they're negligent in thinking about this, and then it, it does cause trouble, either for them or for her. It gets, you know, people are going to start gossiping about her sleeping her way to the top, or he's showing favoritism because he's attracted. That's the kind of gossip we're concerned about. So there are some antidotes to this. One of the people we got to uh, hear from was a vice president of Goldman Sachs. He said, you know, I realized at some point that almost all my mentees were men. And, and then I realized, well, where do you do most of your mentoring? I'm really busy during the day. Almost all my mentoring happened to drinks or dinner in the evening after work. And women weren't comfortable with that. And I hadn't been very thoughtful about it for different reasons. Maybe she's afraid of the gossip. Maybe she, if she uh, has a family, we know in 2017 she's still doing more work at home than, than he is, even if she's got uh, a partner. Um, so, for various reasons, women were not uh, coming to him for mentoring and weren't following up. So he said, I changed it up. I now have a breakfast, lunch only policy. And he said, I'll own, I have my assistant schedule all my mentorships only for a breakfast or lunch meeting at a cafe right near Goldman Sachs. It's very transparent. And he said, in the last year or so since I've implemented this, yeah, I've, I've totally changed the landscape. So men and women really kind of equally are seeking me out. A um, couple things guys have to be thoughtful about. Don't be sneaky about mentoring a woman. Be very transparent, be thoughtful. Mentor lots of women, don't mentor just one. If you're a guy who doesn't mentor women and you suddenly start spending lots of time with just one woman, people might find that odd and that you might be offering them some grist from the mill. Um, be, uh, be sort of that guy who's uh, talking about mentoring and, and doing it very publicly. Uh, and, and just be cautious about keeping anything secret. One of the other things we all know, to, if you're new to an organization, it helps to have that insider knowledge, the hidden politics, and you need somebody to kind of show you the ropes along the way there, and that's always very helpful. Um, and certainly the same thing happens even, even when you're climbing up in the organization, right? You get to that next level and maybe you're in the civilian world, you're getting to the C-suite finally, um, academia, or getting to the dean's level, or whatever it might be, right? There's still more, again, that insider knowledge, and, and sometimes hidden politics about relationships and things there that you need to know. Where does that get shared in your organization? How is it, how is it done? Um, certainly, 
many of you probably heard or seen where often sometimes uh, business is done on the golf course, right? Uh, which can be okay. It kind of depends on your organization and your people. Um, and there's other places, again, times and places where access, right? Access to the, this information is not equal and it's not shared in the same way. Uh, so as male mentors, we need to be thoughtful and be thinking about that. It's like, so, all right, so who had access, who was included, wasn't included in, in ways that, you know, well, maybe not intentionally, but again, because we really weren't being completely thoughtful about how we were organizing it. So I'll give you an example. Um, um, Kathy Hannon, who was with uh, KPMG, uh, brand new partner, exciting for her, first woman partner there, and, and Kathy was telling us a story, which was so excited. They were doing this two-day offsite, and it was set up by a guy that was done well in advance, um, and it was done at a golf course, which is fine. You know, Kathy was happy to play golf with the guys and do all that. The problem was that it was set up at an all-male exclusive golf club. <laughs> Everywhere she went, she had to have an escort, right? And and then when the guys retired to the cabin at night to have their brandy and cigars or whatever they were doing, you know, she wasn't included, right? And so this is again where, as a group, as a team, you know, right, with the organization, you're not giving full and equal access, and we have to be thoughtful and be thinking about those in different ways. The same way that we Brad mentioned with the female, uh, the congressional staffers. Again, it's a informal policy, but it has, I mean, huge ramifications for the advancement and the opportunities for everybody. So Dave, um, I just checked in with our Commander-in-Chief here at the conference, and we should probably stop at uh, 315. So, should, okay. so to leave lots of question time, yeah. should we just each pick our favorite one last one sure. and then wrap it up? Okay. Uh, I, want to, I want the Cheryl Sandberg slide, so do you want to do this one? or? Okay, no, I'll let you fun. choose. So um, last couple we'll share with you, and I want to have time to, to interact with you. Um, one of the things Cheryl Sandberg uh, really kind of drove home in our discussion with her was the importance of men um, talking out loud and kind of opening doors and creating opportunities for women in mentoring. Sometimes men are a little reluctant to do this for various reasons. Uh, she, she told us when I graduated from college, my very first job was as the assistant to Larry Summers, Secretary of the Treasury. And she said, everywhere I went with Larry Summers in that first uh, year, he would introduce me to folks and say, this is Cheryl Sandberg. She graduated top of her class in economics at Harvard. She is just a rock star. I couldn't do what I'm doing without her. You really ought to get to know her and maybe uh, find out what she's working on. Uh, and after the third or fourth time, Cheryl pulled Larry Summers aside and said, Larry, that's embarrassing. Stop. And, and he said, I'm not going to stop because that's what mentors do. I am opening doors. I'm networking for you. When I talk to people about you this way, they're going to get to know you. They're going to want you to work for them. This is how your career launches. And you need to let me do that for you and just let me be a mentor. Betsy Meyer said the same thing about David Gergen, that she calls him a raving fan for her. And bottom line, what these folks are doing is talking about her while she's not even in the room. So it's one thing to talk about her when she's right there. It's quite something else for you to be telling people how great she is when she's not even there. And, and often if you're a senior male, that's going to really carry some weight when you're championing somebody that way. You need to be willing to do it. Last thing I want to share related to this is Cheryl Sandberg said, even now, with all that I've achieved, I still occasionally question myself, and I have the imposter syndrome occasionally. Um, I, and I'll, I'll just share a final personal story. My sister, Shannon, is a Navy captain, absolute rock star. She's the XO at Balboa Naval Hospital right now. And she is, uh, she is just amazing. Her last job, she was director of mental health at Portsmouth, and they had a fun run on a Friday with all the director staff. And Shannon's older than many of the other uh, people on the executive board, and, and most of them are men. And I called her that Saturday, and she was kind of sad. And I said, Shannon, what's up? She said, well, I went to that fun run yesterday, and I won. Uh, and <laughs> so I said, great. She said, well, no, I, I wasn't really thinking, and I just went for it. Shannon's really fit. 
And so there she is, kind of stretching and doing her warm down at the, at the end. And these guys are coming across the finish line, many of them younger than her, people she were. And they're all kind of startled to see Shannon blew their doors off. And then she started to feel bad because a lot of them were coming up to her. Yeah, my Achilles uh, wasn't very good. You know, I had a cramp. They're, they they were having to explain how a, a woman beat them at this race. And, and then she was internalizing the bias, saying, I shouldn't have you know, pushed it that hard. I, I didn't want to make them feel bad. And it led to a great discussion about, you know, no matter what you achieve, you still are struggling a bit with gender socialization. We all are. We all carry that with us uh, into our career, no matter how accomplished we are. Want to do one I'll last just, one? Yeah, my last one. I'll leave you with, uh, because I think this is important for uh, the men to hear, too. And I think the women in the room, as you think about your, your male mentors and those relationships, to, to think about how, what this looks like. So one of the things that we, we talk to men a lot about is how to approach this type of relationship um, and not necessarily to approach it from what many of us have heard stereotypically about the, you know, the, the male mentor is the all-knowing guru, and I'm here to impart upon you all my knowledge and guidance and fix all your problems, right? And that's not, as Brad stated at the very beginning, that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a good two-way mutual relationship, right? And so we ask guys to think about it from a learning orientation and to, and to approach each of your mentoring relationships with a little bit of humility that, again, that I have something to learn uh, from my mentees. Uh, in particular, we talk about gender humility in the book, and that, you know, hey, we're guys, you know, and I've never, I don't know what it's like to live the life of a woman. You know, I can't necessarily put myself in your shoes as a woman and to say that I, I, I've experienced that I can't do that. But I can listen, and I can appreciate, and I can empathize with what you're telling me if I listen and do that. So to approach each of those uh, cross-gender relationship with a little bit of gender humility and that I have something, I listen for a little bit, I'm, I'm going to learn something. I'm going to learn something maybe about a part of my organization, part of my team, that uh, will put me more in touch, make me more helpful, more useful, and maybe more, more productive in what we're trying to accomplish. So maintaining that learning orientation I think is really important. And all, to a T, almost every single male mentor we talked to, somewhere along the interview, they came back and they said, you know, now that we've been talking about this, I feel guilty about this whole thing. I was like, what? What do you mean? And, and said, so, no, you know, I think I learned more and I got more out of this mentoring relationship than my mentee did. And it was really interesting to see that come up as a theme over and over again with all the male mentors. Um, I did a, a presentation uh, a few weeks ago uh, with the Marine Corps on gender bias, and it was really interesting. Um, so we were talking about mentoring relationships and the biases within them that I had. Um, a three-star Marine General stopped me in the middle of the talk, and he stood up and he goes, I just want all of you to know that in all of my mentoring relationships, and especially the ones with, with women who are people who are different from me, and not just old white guys like me, the way he said it, I feel like I've learned so much more than I, I've been given them. And I was like, well, thanks, gentlemen. I mean, you couldn't have made the point any better for me in that way. So maintaining that learning orientation, uh, approaching a little gender humility goes a long way out there. And with that, I think we're going to stop and we'll let you take some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. I'm wondering if like, when you talk to Cheryl or any of the other women, if you ask them about their relationships mentoring men at their company. That was not a focus of our interviews with them. Um, you know, very often, the, the, many of the people we talked to were prolific mentors. Um, I, I think sometimes the very same hurdles and biases and you know internalized kinds of impediments uh, affect the relationships the other direction as well. Um, the research on question or mentoring suggests that men have traditionally been less likely to seek women mentors. Mm -hmm. And many of, I think the biggest explanation for that is in, in history, women have held less power in organizations. So, so they just haven't seen women as good mentors for that sort of advancement. Um, but in terms of the dynamics, no, we didn't, uh, unless you got any. I, I would just tell you that, in, in a, you know, not so much the interviews, but now there's research coming out, especially as there's focus more on the millennial generation now. Um, and the work that we've been doing around male allies as well, that we're, what we're finding is now there are more 
junior men who are getting mentored by some more senior women because the numbers are shifting right. in, in the workplace. And what's the early research is starting to show that the men, these, you know, these junior men who are mentored by women, um, have a much more gender inclusive perspective of the workplace. Um, they have better interpersonal skills, and it, it often translates outside the workplace into the, the home as well. So early research just starting to come out now. It'll be interesting to see where that goes, but uh, certainly a lot of positives, and I'm not completely surprised that you to see that. One of the meta messages for guys we try to deliver is this isn't just good for her, this is good for you. And it's going to make you better in all kinds of areas of life, and uh, it's going to translate for you if you do this well. There was a question in the back here. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yep. So um, I'm one of those women that tear up when I get, when something moves me, I'm passionate about it. So I just wanted to add to that conversation a little bit. Um, one of the ways that I've always approached the, the crying issue um, as a, with the approach that it's a loss of control. So, like, just like, you know, stereotypically when men get in the workplace, when they get frustrated or whatever, they lose control and they start yelling and throwing things, which I'm sure many of us have seen, I've certainly seen that on my ships. Um, I, I tell my folks that crime's the same thing. Like, crime's okay, but there's a time and a place for it. Right? So don't do it right now. You know, wait till you get into an appropriate place where you can release those emotions, and that's healthy. Um, but work on your control. So for me, it's always been a control thing. That's what I, I, I absolutely agree with you on. You know, the thing with where guys release differently than you know, the anger piece, and there's so many lots to, to prove that. Um, the other aspect, though, we we talk about this from a mentoring relationship perspective, right? So now you're with your mentor. And so you're not necessarily, I mean, it is professional, but you're not necessarily like in front of the troops or whatever, like right? people are saying things. So um, there's, a, there's a time and a place where it, you know, tears might happen. And it's, they mean different things, just like you said. If you get really excited about something, very passionate about something, you get moved by something, and, and yes, maybe some tears. Well, it also depends how you were raised and how you were socialized. And so people are different. And for the guys, you know, <laughs> we always joke with the guys, like, so. Do I have to get comfortable with this? Or like, yeah, you know, maybe you need to do a little therapy and uh, a little exposure therapy is okay. And go watch some Oprah reruns and get yourself a box of Kleenex and it'll be all right. And, and just, you know, remember that, you know, she's a person just like you are. We have emotions and reactions. And it doesn't necessarily mean you hurt her feelings if she, if she cries, right? Um, you still need to deliver the, the critical feedback on, on, the, on that side of it as well. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for your talk and the interesting exercise at the beginning. Um, the title of your book, uh, I guess this question ties to some of the other questions, how and why men should mentor women, is, I understand the reason you did the study, you explained that very well. Uh, still, it could perpetuate the notion in our society that men are always going to be in a position, a, a power position. And I wondered if you considered a sequel or something that could balance that yes. and maybe in relation to what you said about the way boys are raised uh, to suppress their feelings. And I just wondered if you had thought of a next, a next book, a next study. We've got about four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, people ask that a lot. You're not alone. People wonder, what about flipping it? And how about women mentoring men? And, and what are those dynamics? And what are the, the outcomes? There are a few things there. In terms of why we started with this one, the immediate need seems to be get guys to step up. And, and, and until the gender balance changes a bit, especially in leadership, we'd sure love men to be a bit more deliberate and thoughtful. I, I think that's a huge missing ingredient in changing the gender landscape of work. As things evolve and you know we get more parity, this is going to become crucial that we understand you know how the relationship works the other way. Um, and I have to tell you that the research isn't very good yet uh, in that area, so it's fairly limited. Maybe because there's just been fewer of those relationships to evaluate so far, um, but it's interesting. We do find that when women are in a mentoring role, they tend to do a better job of doing both career and personal mentorship. And so they give more of the psychosocial functions. Men sometimes struggle. You find men not doing as much psychosocial. So they're good with career advice, 
challenge, you know, all the, the career progression. We don't do the relationship piece so much, and that's equally important, mentees will tell you. So we know women are already doing a little better that way when they're in a mentor role, but it'll be interesting to see. So yes, look for that in book number four. <coughs> but, but yeah, we, and we've talked about that, we put that particular book. Um, to, to really think about it in terms of looking down the road, that the, the numbers and the percentages are going to are going to shift, and they are going to change. And what does that what does that do to the workplace, right, and relationships, and mentoring, and all the other aspects of professional development that we do? Um, so we don't we don't assume that it's status quo. Matter of fact, it's all about changing the status quo. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. It's super interesting. I just wanted to know if there's any research to show. Um, not just men who are mentoring women, but we know women are not all monolithic. They come from very different backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, racial and ethnic backgrounds. What are the numbers that are associated with, to the three-star general's point, men who are mentoring women that don't look like them or their daughters or are the same religion? Are those numbers even lower? In terms of frequency? Frequency or, or um, adaptability to want to mentor women that yeah. they know. It, often you see that, and then you can jump into uh, Often you see the, the research um, not take into account intersectionality very well. So there are all these studies on gender and mentoring and, and studies on race and other kind of cultural variables, although there are a lot of them. But you rarely see the nice intersectional studies that take into account more variables and, and look at frequencies that way. Um, what you do find with other cultural diversity issues, those relationships are slower to get started. So, for me to initiate a relationship with somebody who looks different racially or in some other cultural domain, you find lower rates. Uh, if you just wait for me to go ahead and initiate a relationship, they're slower to get started. When you pair those folks in a formal mentoring program, you find that the effects are just as powerful. Uh, so it's the challenge seems to be getting people to initiate, initiate, yeah, get them to initiate the relationship. So if you can do that, so if you can create a culture of that sort of mentoring where people initiate relationships with someone who's culturally different, you find the outcomes you know, equally positive. So I don't know that there's a great solution. It says a lot about the bias that still exists, beyond exactly. gender bias. We really look for people that remind us of ourselves. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's where those formal mentoring programs, while often they don't, those mentorships maybe not don't last as long and maybe they, they're not as fruitful as, as the more informal, hey, we have a connection and we come together grassroots-wise. Um, but for, for people who are not in the you know mainstream, then it, this is what gets started, what gets rolling. And if you can create that culture of mentoring within the organization, you can, you can have leadership um, out there talking about it and holding other leaders accountable for doing it, to show the value in it and reward it, and that's really what's going to change it. Do we need to, are you giving us a shepherd's hook? <laughs> we'll be around, we can answer yeah, some more we'll questions. Stay around. Thank you for your time. Thank you.